Tonight, a story, a discussion most of us never imagined having in this country. Desperate Australians in the tens of thousands stuck and eager to come home. Shortly, we'll hear their pleas to our leaders for help. There are families torn apart by state and territory border closures, relationships put on hold and businesses that are crumbling. These are deeply personal and unusually important questions. So let's get you some answers. Welcome to Q&A. Hi there, welcome to the program. Joining me tonight, social and business entrepreneur Tanya de Jong, who says COVID restrictions are dividing us and taking away our rights, jobs and futures. Deputy Prime Minister and Nationals Leader Michael McCormack is here. In Perth, the AMA President, Dr Omar Khurshid, who is calling for a national agreement to simplify border exemptions. The Shadow Home Affairs Minister, Senator Christina Keneally, is here. And constitutional law expert Kim Rubenstein, who says Aussies stranded abroad could argue caps on arrivals are unlawful. Please make all of them feel welcome. <laughs> it's nice to have a few more of you in the studio tonight. Remember, uh, you can stream us on iView, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Quanda is the hashtag. Each week we invite our panellists to join in a robust and respectful debate. So if you are getting involved on social media, we do ask that of you too. Before we get started, some basic facts. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has told us right now there are more than 25,000 Australians registered as wanting to come home. It estimates that around 3,500 of those are vulnerable. The government says it is working with the states and airlines to increase the weekly cap on arrivals, which stands currently at 4,000. You have inundated us this week from all over the world with your questions and stories. This is Tony and Bernie Cannon. They went to Dublin to be with their dying daughter and have been trying to return since her funeral in July. This is David McGilchrist, who's been stuck in Venezuela for six months. Hayley Pack is in London. She and her fiancé gave up their jobs and their rental property only to have their flight home cancelled. They're now stranded. And this is Taj Martin Simpson living in Laos. It took 12 months and $12,000 to secure a visa for her partner. It'll expire if they can't get home by November. That's just a sample of the many questions and stories we've heard this week. We'll try to get to as many as possible. This leads us to our first question tonight. It's from Julia Mickler, who's in our studio audience. Uh, Julia, just tell us a little bit about your situation. What's your question? Uh, question? Yeah. OK, my husband was given permission to leave Australia on compassionate grounds in July to see his dying father in Germany. Unfortunately, his return flight was cancelled due to the cap on international arrivals and he's been a unable to return home to Australia. Um, this is not very compassionate. And I'd like to ask, why doesn't the government have a system in place to ensure that people allowed to leave on compassionate grounds can return home again? So your husband, Andreas, is over there right now. What's yes. the situation for you at home? How hard is it? So we've... Um, We've got a daughter with a rare genetic condition called um, Batten's disease or childhood dementia. She's um, blind with yeah, a severe disability. Um, and so life is difficult at the best of times. Um, You've reduced the amount of care that you receive because of con concerns about COVID. Yeah, so during COVID we've reduced supports because we don't want to have COVID sort of come into our home and my husband provides a lot of support. And he is the income in the household. His job is on hold, I think, is that correct? So he's taken leave, but it was intended to be a limited time. He should be back at work now. OK. Let's put that to the Deputy Prime Minister. Why can't you get people like this home? It pretty, seems pretty simple. Oh, these are heart-wrenching stories, Hamish, and, you know, my heart does go out to, to your situation and we're doing everything that we can and, obviously, uh, uh, we're putting the vulnerable cases uh, first and foremost. I mean, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade are working with individuals uh, on these sorts of cases. There are more than 20 airlines flying into Australia. I know back in March the Prime Minister urged and encouraged, even implored Australians, if they could, to come home, appreciating that uh, your situation arose after that. 374,000 Australians have come home. 
Yes, we are limited by the uh, quarantine capacity uh, that the state's asked us to put in place. Uh, I've spoken to uh, many of the premiers uh, just today as to whether we can look at those caps and we can, in fact, extend them. They are limited by their capacity, but we're doing everything we can, particularly for vulnerable cases such as yours. And again, I say my heart does go out to you. Christina Keneally. 25,000 Australians stranded overseas. I mean, is there any more Australian value than look after your mates, don't leave your mates behind? You know, that Australian passport says right in the front that it entitles the bearer to seek assistance from the Commonwealth when they are overseas and in need of help. You know, with all due respect, Michael, there's a lot more that could be done here. Yes, there's a weekly cap of 4,000, but it's not at capacity. It hasn't been at capacity. Secondly, there are caps on individual cities. Uh, there are only four cities where international flights are currently allowed to arrive. Why aren't we using Darwin or, or Gold Coast or Canberra where we could have international airports? There's 13 airports in Australia that can take international Let's flights. Let's hear from the Deputy Prime Minister. Why, why can't those options be... Yeah. And indeed, we're exploring those uh, options and opportunities as, as we speak. We're, we're certainly looking at this. We're certainly looking but, but this and doing is not everything that we can. No, it, it's not a new problem, but it's also a problem that has been uh, exacerbated by states closing their borders. It's a, a problem this exacerbated has nothing to by... Do with, with all respect, this has nothing to do with states closing their borders. Well, states the have the Commonwealth them. announced a hard shutdown of the international border on the 20th of March. The caps were brought in on international arrivals eight weeks ago. The Prime Minister even acknowledged then that there would be a difficulty for some Australians coming home. There's been no plan put in place. You know, each plane is capped at 30 people. You know, cities are capped at the number of arrivals. We have quarantine facilities. Quarantine is a Commonwealth responsibility. I. I as well, requested life... by premiers and uh, being a former a... premier yourself, Christina, you would know that. It is a Commonwealth responsibility. The Commonwealth at the beginning of this crisis brought people home from Wuhan, brought them through Darwin and put them into quarantine facilities run by the Commonwealth. It is the Commonwealth's responsibility to fundamental responsibility to look after stranded Australians when they're overseas. Hamish, this government was very quick to put in place a plan to ship seafood out of the country. If you are a lobster or a crayfish, you get a chartered flight out of Australia. We've spent $350 million and 1,800 chartered flights taking our seafood out of Australia. Now, that's great for seafood trade. But what have we done for stranded Australians? How many chartered flights? None. Okay. How much have we spent bringing them back? And sheep, meat, Nothing. and fruit and vegetables. And you, you oh, have great. To... So if no, you're no, a sheep no, no, no. or but, a lobster, you get a chartered flight. If you're a stranded too, Australian, you I know, don't I know you get... forget farmers, but you've got to protect farmers. I just said it was great for trade, mm. but can't a government do two things Let at once? Let me just bring in the rest of our panel. Kim Rubenstein, what, what are citizens' rights? Andreas is stuck over there. His wife is here in the studio. She wants an answer about his situation, her family's situation. And what I, are their rights? And I think your question also reminds us that the rights of citizens are not only those people who are outside of the country, but of course the significant number of citizens around Australia who have connections outside of Australia, whether it be through family or through other frameworks, because in a globalised world that we'd experienced, most Australians had the real privilege of that travel and connection to more than one country. But the bottom line, Hamish, is that it's not clear what citizens' uh, rights are in Australia. And in fact, COVID has really amplified some of the structural problems that we have in our constitution. And I've brought my constitution along because it, <laughs> I feel that COVID has really reminded us of how fundamental it is in relation to the everyday aspects of our lives and including in this profound scenario citizens who have travelled and are now being restricted in, um, in terms of their return. But in our constitution, there actually isn't any reference to Australian citizenship, nor to citizenship rights. And it seems curious that your fundamental constitutional document doesn't actually set out who the constitution is for. And there are several reasons why the framers in the 1890s actually chose not to include citizenship in in the Constitution, both in terms of the federal um, responsibility over legislation, but also in terms of um, membership of the mm. community. One was because we were British subjects at the time, and so there was a strong sense of connection to um, the Commonwealth. 
A second reason was with the new federal structure, which no doubt we'll come back mm. to in terms of internal borders, there was a concern, well, what would citizenship as a, as a status um, lead to? And the reason I'm telling you this, um, Hamish, is because it meant that there is no specific reference to who is protected by the Constitution, nor is there any rights protection explicitly okay. stated. We are going to have to move on, but Julia, this, this is your chance. I mean, you've heard the responses from the politicians. What do you want to say to the Deputy Prime Minister? What do you want to ask him? I just think my, my husband uh, applied for an exemption to the travel ban and it was provided on compassionate grounds. And I know you said the, the department's working on it. Well. We haven't heard from them. My husband was due back and we haven't... We don't know when he's coming back. And that uncertainty, he can't tell his employer when he's coming back. We don't know when he's coming back. Is it going to be months if flights keep getting cancelled? Deputy Prime Minister, do you understand why saying we are working on it for these families isn't enough? Oh, I, I, I can. And, look, there are so many thousands of compassionate cases, yours being one of them. And, you know, we're doing everything that we can to put those vulnerable people uh, at the front of the queue. Uh, it is very, very difficult. Yours and so many other situations. Uh, uh, like I said before... But if there's, there's 3,500 individuals that you know are vulnerable, why don't you put flights on and get them home? Well, we're having away? those discussions with airlines. And as I say, there are 20 airlines flying into Australia at the moment. Uh, we want to make sure that we have the, the quarantine So, so you're capacity. considering more rescue flights? Oh, look, we're, we're, we're nothing. No, there's no option off the table at the moment. Everything is being considered because we have situations like yours. It's, it's, it's awful. It's terrible. And there are so many people... I, I, I'm just there's, going to press you, press you on this. Are you considering rescue flights? We're, nothing is, is off the table at the moment. We're considering every option. OK, let's take our next question tonight. It's a video from Ella Callanan in Geneva, Switzerland. I am a 28-year-old student who is stuck in Switzerland with my young baby. I am suffering from severe postpartum depression, which is being exacerbated by my isolation and separation from my family, who is in Sydney. I am alone in Switzerland with no support. I wish to return to Sydney. However, I fear for hotel quarantine alone with my baby for 14 days will be detrimental to my health as well as my baby's well-being. I'm also unable to afford the costs of hotel quarantine. I have made an application to be exempt from hotel quarantine. However, after more than one month, I'm yet to receive a reply. Despite being an Australian citizen, I feel like my own country has turned its back on me. Like many other Australian citizens, the restrictions being put in place are detrimental and exacerbating an already significant problem with mental health and depression. Why am I, like many other Australian citizens, being ignored in favour of isolationist policies? Omar Khashid. It's a, it's, a, it's a very sad story and it does underline the impact of this virus and the various rules that have been put in place on ordinary Australians all over the world. There is more that can be done uh, and to, to go back to the previous question, uh, the government could do something right now if it really wanted to. It, like all what? the figures, all the figures are arbitrary. The 4,000 caps, that's an arbitrary number. The size of hotel quarantine, that's arbitrary. The, the way that hotel quarantine is done is, is changeable and I think a little bit of compassion is what is needed here to, to look after the lives of Australians and that also means protecting us here in Australia from the virus. Uh, uh, so, don't, uh, don't, so don't take what I said as not being supportive of hotel quarantine. It is the thing. The border, international border restrictions are the one most successful measure that has protected this country from the virus and when it goes wrong, as we've seen so horribly demonstrated in Victoria, the, the effects are, are, are terrible. So we need, we need, we do need the the, uh, the border restrictions. We do need the hotel quarantine. But uh, the government can look after Australians at the same time. Uh, Omar Khosh, given that this may be something that is a long-term scenario that Australia and the world is in, should we be looking at more structured uh, facilities, quarantine facilities? Uh, Northern Territory was referenced. Christmas Island uh, has been referenced as well. I mean. Do you think Australia needs to have a returning passenger quarantine system in place? 
Uh, it's certainly something that, that should be looked at. Uh, there are risks and benefits with that sort of approach and they can feel, I think, a little like a prison, uh, as many of our asylum seekers would know. Uh, so but so, definitely... so too these hotel rooms that people find themselves locked in for two weeks without a window or a balcony that they can open? Yeah, the, the hotel uh, quarantine is tough, but it's something that's been brought in very quickly uh, without a lot of time. And as we know, it, it takes government an awful long time to do most things. Uh, but, you know, there's no doubt there is an opportunity for the government to do more, uh, to expand the quarantine, to do it in different ways. But it's absolutely imperative that the quarantine is, is strong and that we don't let the virus escape. I think the other thing, though, that can be done uh, for uh, people in the terrible situations of being stuck overseas for the moment is to reach out uh, with more mental health services from Australia. And, and the AMA would certainly like to see the government look into what, what could we do from Australia to help uh, whilst uh, Australians who are struggling are still stuck until they can get back to Australia. What else can we do to reach out and assist them? Tanya de Jong, what do you make of all of this, the way Australian citizens are now finding themselves appealing for help to, to just come home? Look, I find the whole situation dreadfully heartbreaking. Um, people with mental illness who are isolated in this way are suffering severe trauma, and that trauma will probably stay with them for a lifetime. Um, and we need to do everything that we can to bring them home. But Courses... what does that look like? I mean, the Deputy <laughs> Prime Minister is saying they're trying everything they can, mm. but these people are still stuck. Well. I, I agree with what's been said here. We just have to do everything we can to increase the cap. Um, I, I also believe that it would be a worthwhile strategy to look at ankle braces for people, um, and that's one way that they can feel more comfortable in their own homes and, and be restricted and still follow COVID-safe rules. I mean, there's many people <laughs> that would object very strongly to the idea of putting mm -hmm. ankle bracelets on people returning home from overseas. Do you see why? No. <laughs> Is that something the government would consider, Deputy mm. Pierre? It's not something we've considered thus far. I know Mark McGowan, the Premier of Western Australia, raised it. And, uh, you know, Western Australia's uh, uh, got a good record um, as far as COVID cases are concerned, uh, or the lack thereof. But that's not something that we've actually uh, discussed as a government. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that Australians' mental health is something that... Uh, is is being looked after, and I have to commend. But, but this, but this case here, well, is someone I, well, that finds I have to commend Greg being Hunt for, for putting that first and foremost. Uh, we, we've put uh, a lot of funding towards making sure that the that the right mental health uh, situation is is being addressed, uh, and we will continue how, to do that. We'll continue how, to monitor that. What support is Ella Callanan getting? It, it's difficult when people are overseas to actually get. Uh, them to be able to access the services. Of course, we've got a number of websites and that, but actually uh, getting to them uh, personally and individually in wherever uh, situation they find themselves in whatever country in the world they are uh, at the moment, it, it's a bit difficult to, to get that out. Certainly here in Australia, uh, you know, the, the delivery of mental health services has been very good and I commend mm. Greg Hunt and the uh, and Professor Brenda Murphy and Paul Kelly for doing what they've done in that regard. To, to the point Omar made, though, about the caps being arbitrary, why don't you increase them? Why can't we let in... Well, we've, more than we've allowed the Premiers to actually uh, give us the number that they felt comfortable, that they could manage and maintain whilst making sure that the uh, integrity of the quarantine system was what it needs to be so that we don't get more community transmission, so that we don't get more clusters. And yes, it is very difficult. I know New South Wales has borne the brunt of having the most cases come in. Of course, we've had a situation in Melbourne where they haven't had an international flight for many, many weeks. And so that has placed additional pressure because Sydney and Melbourne, of course, are the two biggest uh, international inbound uh, destinations uh, for our airlines. And so that has been very difficult, having Melbourne out of the equation. I have to say New South Wales has borne the brunt and has paid for a lot of the quarantine services as well. OK, let's take our next question. It comes from Donald Brady in the audience. Hi, panel. I've just completed two weeks in hotel quarantine, having uh, spent some time with my mother overseas after she was diagnosed with terminal cancer. My question for you is, with curfews, internal borders and the overseas travel ban, which I might add is the strictest measure of any comparable democracy globally, has the government gone too far with Australia essentially resembling a North Korean-style dictatorship rather than a, a modern democracy? Kim. 
So Article 12 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights certainly makes clear the right of freedom of movement. But when we bring it back into an Australian context, that doesn't have direct application within Australia. And so the Constitution does become the framework for thinking about this. I mentioned before that there's no reference to citizenship in the Constitution. But there are two key cases that are really important in thinking about whether it is lawful to have these bans as the way they are. One what, was what's, a, your, what's your view? My view is that there is a real question as to their lawfulness because of a right that the High Court identified in an interesting case, Air Caledonia, it was an airline um, challenging an earlier decision by government to impose what was called a clearance fee for passengers coming through to Australia. And one of the problems with that clearance fee, which Air Caledonia successfully challenged, was that it was actually like a tax. And under the Constitution, you can't have taxing in an act with another piece of legislation. And the key point that the High Court point, um, um, based their decision on that it was a tax was that citizens, and they said very clearly, have a common law right of re-entry into Australia. And therefore, that charge couldn't be placed on citizens. That was therefore a tax and had to be separated. So that was one key point that the High Court identified as a right of return. Mm. The other is... What about leaving? Because th this is really what the question is about. It's about the freedom of movement in and out of the country. So in terms of free, either living here or, or leaving, they're wrapped up in the one concept. And the more recent case, which many people will be um, familiar with, is the case that the High Court looked at of Indigenous Australians mm -hmm. who are not citizens but who were are members of um, Indigenous families and have lived in Australia. And again, the High Court recognised that there was a clear right for those individuals who are not even citizens but belongers and non-aliens in terms of the constitutional language of their right of freedom of movement. So there is a peg upon which these individuals could actually challenge the lawfulness of these caps. Now, the government certainly has powers in relation to international national trade and commerce, but are there limitations on the extent of that power? And I would argue that there, there is something in those statements of the High Court to challenge the balancing act that is going on here in terms of these bans in relation to those but freedoms. Christina Keneally, it's a bit unfair, isn't it, to describe Australia as like a North Korean dictatorship? Look, I can understand, particularly for people who are living in Melbourne right now, who are doing it really tough, that it does feel very oppressive. Uh, and, and, you know, I think we've all been saying this, but it needs to be said again that our hearts go out to them for the, the situation they're in. I have family I speak to in Melbourne at least once a week, and it's so difficult, especially for the children. But I don't think it's a... It's a fair comparison, no. It's not a valid comparison. Should we Australians are... be allowed to leave more freely uh, well, if they choose? Well, uh, let's put... Let me say this, Hamish. What I think we should have now, six months into this, is a plan. I think we should have a plan, a clearly articulated strategy for what is a COVID normal Australia? What's a COVID normal community? What's a COVID normal economy look like? What we have is a national cabinet, a so-called national cabinet that broke apart. We don't have consensus. We don't even have clear sense of what is the national strategy. Are we going for eradication or suppression? And when it comes to things like, can, are we allowed to leave the country? You know, as the shadow minister for home affairs, I get a lot of these requests come to my office. And it's wildly varying decisions get made by the Australian Border Force, and I'm not blaming them. Mm. They've been foisted this on them with no clear guidelines or rules. They've been asked to invent something overnight. But we're six months into this international hard border closure. It's about time we had some clear guidelines. So, for example, you get a situation... I had a, a man whose wife had miscarried a baby. She was in Lebanon, Lebanon, and he was trying to get over there to be with her, and he wasn't being allowed to leave. Meanwhile, we got a guy here in Sydney that was... cos his local member made a representation, got permission to go to Greece and pick up his yacht. I mean, you can't I think, I think have a different clear, group... Though. You can't have it, one rule for one group of people and one rule for another. We need some clear guidelines and a plan in place. Oh, my gosh, she's trying to get it. it yeah, it's, it's pretty clear what the strategy is, even though it hasn't really been communicated well to Australians. But the, the, the strategy is suppress and eliminate the virus, 
get our economy as normal as possible and hope and pray for a vaccine quickly. And, and whilst uh, none of our politicians are willing to say it, that's what we've been doing. And these uh, rules, which do seem oppressive at times, uh, if you look at it through that lens, uh, where it's been effective, uh, it actually works and it's delivered the best health outcomes uh, in the world and mm -hmm. the smallest impact on our economy uh, compared with, with most other countries. So whilst it is, uh, it's tough, it's very difficult uh, and there's a lot of Australians who've been negatively affected by it, uh, when you look at the alternative, uh, which is Europe-style tens of thousands of vulnerable people dying and huge economic losses, uh, I think we're doing pretty well here. Uh, Tanya de Jong? I'm going to sing now. <laughs> we are one, but we are many. And from all the lands on earth we come. I'm not going to participate in the sing-along. We share a dream <laughs> and sing with one voice. I am, you, you are. are, we are Australian. Yeah, this song... You are, I should point out, you are a, a trained soprano. I am. <laughs> and I'm not. <laughs> Put That's it OK, I love doing a duet with you anyway. But what's the point you want to no, make? No, I, I just want to say, I mean, this song symbolises a nation whose people, culture, history and landscape are deeply intertwined. This song celebrates our unity and our diversity and this crisis has made a mockery of our inclusive spirit. You know, we are supposed to all be Australians, but now we're West Australians, Canberrans, Victorians and so on. Thank you. And thank you for that. And we shut and open our borders on a whim blocking out the others at the expense of lives, livelihoods, families, our mental and physical health. We're supposed to be one nation, but we've never been more divided, disconnected and depressed. This is not OK. We need a national response and we need to start including all the people who are in Australia. And what is the risk of leaving this country? What is the risk to Australia of people being allowed to leave? Uh, I'm just going to draw <laughs> it back to the original question, which was about leaving the country. Yeah. Deputy and Prime Minister, the point has been made over and over again. There are so many Australians that have very good, compassionate grounds, it would seem, to leave, to do things like visit a terminally ill mother that have been, in some cases, not allowed, and yet Tony Abbott is allowed to leave to go and take up a job in Britain. Why? But, but to Donald's point about... Uh, comparing Australia to North Korea. I don't think Kim Jong-un has a job... Yeah, but I'm, I'm just asking you why, there's, in why there's one set of rules for many Australians but a different rule for Tony Abbott. Well, there, we're also limited by the fact that uh, Qantas and Virgin are not flying internationally. We're limited by the number of airlines flying in and out of Australia. Uh, and I appreciate uh, Tony Abbott is but one person. Uh, so, so but, why was he allowed out? Well, he, he applied for and was granted special exemption. Um, and look, Isn't be that Andrew as it may... Forrest oh, in uh, Croatia right now? I have no idea where Andrew Forrest <laughs> well, is. Well, I heard but... that today. But... <laughs> uh, be that as it may, um, <laughs> you know, if Australians have the capacity to, to leave Australia and there is a, mm. a flight available, then, you know, they, they should be allowed I, to I'm do sorry, so. It's, it's actually... just not, that's just not right. That is just not right. That's not how border force are making these decisions. Like, go and have a chat with them. It's got nothing to do with flight capacity. You have to tell them um, your compelling reason. You have to, if, if, your, if your mother is dying, you have to explain that you are the only person who can go and look after, that there are no other siblings. Like, they don't ask about flight capacity. They actually ask you to justify your reason for But there's not the only country. stranded Australians abroad. There's also stranded Australians living on borders. And, Christina, I have to say, I haven't heard you criticise many of the Labor premiers about the restrictions Great. When are you going to When are you going to pipe up place? and criticise Peter Gutwin in Tasmania or Stephen Marshall in uh, South Australia, who has the exact same hard border policies in place as Labor premiers. Quite frankly, this partisanship politicking is not what the country needs no, right now. Absolutely. What we re need right now is a plan. I don't know how the Prime Minister has the time to pick on Labor premiers. He should be focusing on I the real the enemy, and the very, real enemy very is coronavirus. The real enemy is not his partisan opposition. His real enemy is coronavirus. And thankfully today we made some significant strides forward in a vaccine announcement. We're putting okay. $1.7 billion on the table to not only help Australians, but also to help our friends in the Pacific Islands, because we know that uh, we're not going to get through this 
uh, without a vaccine. And I'm so pleased that uh, uh, there's been such significant steps taken uh, in not only just one uh, development as far as the vaccine is concerned, but two. And so we'll very much uh, look to... Uh, it's great news about the vaccine. I, I'm just going to try and push you for which, an answer which on doesn't this, exist. I, I'm I, trying to understand yeah. what it the rules exist, are. It doesn't exist, but, uh, you know, we're, we're putting money on the table to ensure that uh, uh, that late development stages mm. for the vaccine... With respect, to, to, both to of you, we have a question later on vaccines. Let's just wait okay. until then. Uh, the question was about uh, what, you, what the rules are in relation to individuals being allowed to leave. Why is it that Tony Abbott is allowed to leave, but ordinary citizens in some circumstances with compassionate reasons are not? Well, again, he, he's, he's applied for an exemption and he's been granted it. Look, uh, under, under, and and, and under I, appreciate, under I appreciate that uh, Australian Border but, but Force... For what's the, what's, and and, and what we are, are limited reasons? by the number of airlines which are flying in and out of Australia. It, it just makes sense. If there, if there is very limited flights going out Sorry, of Australia I, I and Australian airlines that. are not flying... Uh, the, internationally, then it makes it very, very difficult to actually be able to have the access available to, to get abroad. Should there be a clear set of rules, Kim Rubenstein, for Australians to understand the grounds upon which they can leave the country at this point in time? A absolutely. And in terms of a democratic framework, a rule of law system requires that there be transparency and accountability in government decision-making. If we think of the framework within which these decisions are being made, there's quite an extensive amount of discretion that's been given to the government. Now, our administrative law system was set up to provide accountability and if we go back to the sort of framework upon, under which these decisions are being made, there has to be a constitutional head of power, which there clearly is under the quarantine head of power for the federal government. The Biosecurity Act is becoming the framework to then delegate powers to decision makers in, um, in the department to make these decisions. Are those discretions properly accountable back to those legislative frameworks? We haven't seen yet any challenges, but there would be grounds for it. And, and the framework it, at this stage is not clear enough in terms of the policy being accountable to the legislative framework. Uh, uh, just to step away from the legal jargon, are you saying this is being made up on the run? Not that it's being made up on the run, but the policy may not be clear enough or transparent enough for people to be able to follow in a way that is consistent, because mm -hmm. consistency in decision making is a fundamental aspect of um, democratic um, the societies. Is, there, there is no manual for COVID-19. Mm. There's no manual that you can pull down from the shelf and say, this is what happened last time we had it. Yes, I suppose we did have it back when the Spanish flu uh, back 100 years ago was uh, having such an impact on society. But there's no modern day equivalent that we can actually pull down off the shelf, open up and say, well, this is what we did when this happened, this is what we'll do now because it so worked So how then. long do Australians need to wait until there is a plan in place? Well, Christina, I think Australians are very fortunate that we have had the limited cases that we've had. And, and, no, I mean and, a plan yes, for those, departures the, and arrivals. The how long till we have so a plan deaths for that? Are, are are tragic and our condolences go out to those families who've lost loved ones. But back on May 23, we had 103 cases. One month and one day, I think it was, that we went without uh, a death from COVID-19. And then, of course, we had the Victorian outbreak. So we had 103 deaths and now, unfortunately, we've, we've got 750 after uh, going... I'm just going to interrupt you there and take our next almost question. Almost four or five it, weeks it without is, a single death. It is going to advance this conversation. Our next question comes from Dipra Ray in the studio. Initially, when the coronavirus spiked, it made sense for states to actually shut down borders to be able to shore up their health resources. That time has now potentially passed, yet states refuse to open borders, driven purely by fear-mongering and potentially politics. Surely having localised lockdowns and in regions should be sufficient. My question is, what is the point of having citizenship or residency in a country if you don't have the ability to freely move within it or to trade within it. And you run a number of small businesses, don't you? I'm involved with a number of businesses, yes. Okay. Tanya de Jong, how do you respond? Yeah, well, I totally agree with you. If you deny freedom of movement, you're effectively denying nationhood. And as I said, we might as well just go and become separate states. But I agree with you as well that we just need to focus on hotspots, on protecting the elderly and the vulnerable beautifully and caringly with love in our hearts because they need our care and focusing on tracking, testing, quarantining effectively, practising COVID safe and letting everyone else go back to their lives and work. Do, do you accept though that closing borders though has protected vulnerable communities, mm -hmm. particularly in mm -hmm. places like the Northern Territory, Western Australia, parts of remote Queensland? I, I do accept that. 
Absolutely, it has. But now we've reached a stage where we should be opening up, and there's. But, a, but what, what evidence do you base that on? Because Melbourne. Well, we only it, have a handful of cases. Uh, Melbourne apart, we only have a handful of active cases in the whole of Australia, and we're not opening up any uh, any of our borders, pretty uh, much. Omar, <laughs> in Western Australia, I know you have a very different perspective on this. Uh, how popular is the border closure there? Uh, Mark McGowan is, I think, our most popular leader ever, and there's no doubt there is broad community support for the very strong uh, border restrictions here in WA. It has protected uh, WA, both our vulnerable communities, uh, including those in the northwest, but also our uh, very important mining sector, which Mark McGowan was pointing out pretty, pretty loudly over the last couple of days, has been protected by his uh, border closure. I don't think, though, that this is the only way, and uh, unfortunately, the outbreak in Victoria just underlined or kind of proved Mark McGowan right. Uh, but if we can get to a state where the Victorian uh, situation is under control, back to uh, very small numbers or no community spread, then I think there's a legitimate uh, question that needs to be asked of the state premiers as to, as to how they can still justify the borders uh, being closed, because there's no doubt there is a negative effect on people, on families, on the movement of workers, on the movement of health workers even, uh, across the borders. Uh, but you know, on the flip side, WA hasn't had 3,000 healthcare workers uh, being infected with COVID like Victoria. We haven't had over 500 elderly people die uh, in, in nursing homes. So the borders have protected us and they can't be just discarded because they're inconvenient. We've got to really look to cooperate, get some strong agreement between the states. Uh, and that means trust, trusting in other states' quarantine arrangements, in other states' contact tracing, because if one state uh, does the wrong thing, the rest of the country gets let down. So At the a... moment, I don't see that trust there. So on that point, Deputy Prime Minister, can the other states trust Victoria's contact tracing now? Well, let's wait and see. At the moment, we haven't been able to do that. New South Wales well, has I mean, this led is the not way a let's for, wait and for see tracking situation. and tracing. This, well, this is a matter uh, of life and well, death for the, many Australians. The number Australians. of cases for Victoria was at its lowest point today for some weeks, and the, their public health officials have to do that uh, tracking and tracing. That is the key, as Dr Omar but, has but just said, to making to sure... Is, can to we making trust sure, their Well, we haven't been able to so far, and we've had that outbreak because of uh, uh, the security guards who did the wrong thing. We had that outbreak because of uh, a family who gathered in too large numbers, and we had that outbreak in Victoria because of a protest rally. Now, appreciate that... Sorry, uh, what's the evidence of the protest rally leading to the outbreak? Well, there were three confirmed cases from one of those protest rallies... That, uh, and the... are you saying that's led to the to the outbreak? Well, now? it has. It didn't help the situation when, but, but, when sorry, the second wave. Sorry, you're drawing wave... a link that I'm not sure is substantial. Well, when the second wave occurred, they they were the three reasons that were given. It was the uh, it was the security failure. It was the uh, it was the family that gathered in too large numbers, and uh, and people who attended a a rally. Uh, 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 were said I'm to not be, sure there's any co... actual evidence that the Black Lives Matter protests led to this outbreak, though. Well. Well, that, that's what, that's what uh, was being said at the time. But do you accept that you were wrong in saying that just now? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think people should be protesting, actually, at the moment. I'm sorry. Uh, in I'm any way, I'm shape just, or I'm form. I'm just testing you on a fact, though. You have put forward that the Black Lives Matter protest in Melbourne <coughs> led to this outbreak. I do not believe that's supported by fact. There were a number of cases of people that had COVID there, but there is no evidence well, supporting that that, that led and, to and this... And given the fact that the public sorry, health officials need, uh, you're, at, you're uh, in Victoria, their tracking and tracing was not to... what it should be, uh, who knows? They, do they don't that... know themselves. So I'm if sorry. there were people at that rally with COVID-19, and that has since been proven that they did have COVID-19, when but they went to that, that protest, to they the... should not have been at that protest, and nor should the that protest that have did been... did not lead to this outbreak. Have, and, and, you know, police resources have been used uh, un, un, unjustly. They should have been doing what their job is, and that is to ensure that law and order is being kept, rather than have to attend and, uh, and babysit a group of protesters who shouldn't have been protesting in the first place. Um, uh, I think um, this uh, is actually quite an important uh, point, though, with respect, Deputy Prime Minister. The, we, we, we do know what happened in Victoria, and we know that the processes around hotel quarantine failed, that the virus was then able to get into uh, some community groups, yes. and then the contact tracing and the public health response was too slow, the lockdowns and restrictions were too slow, and the virus got out into the aged care sector, into the healthcare sector, and into the community in extraordinary numbers. Now, that is the lesson that the rest of the states need to learn. Yep. 
I don't, these restrictions would protect us. Uh, Omar, is there any evidence that the Black Lives Matter protests led to this outbreak in Victoria? Uh, no, I'm certainly not aware of any evidence that the Black Lives uh, Matter protest uh, resulted in the outbreak in Victoria. Uh, but I would agree that congregating in large numbers at the moment does not make sense. Uh, but we shouldn't be hiding from the real causes of the Victorian uh, uh, pandemic uh, uh, outbreak. Christina Keneally. I'm just a bit gobsmacked at what I've just heard from the Deputy Prime Minister uh, trying to assert that this uh, second wave in Victoria is linked directly to the Black Lives Matter protest. I mean, that is just alternate facts, Trumpism, make up your own reality right there. There's no evidence for that. But you know what would really help the contact tracing in Victoria? If we had an app that worked. This COVID safe app from the Commonwealth was supposed to be our ticket to freedom. It was supposed to be our way out. It hasn't yet found one unique contact that wasn't already found by manual tracking and tracing. The New South Wales Opal card has done a better job at tracking coronavirus than this COVID safe app. And what I'm really frustrated by here is that, you know, we have a Commonwealth government that is responsible for the app. They're responsible for aged care. They're responsible for mental health. And yet, all I've heard from the Deputy Prime Minister tonight is, well, we're working on it, and it's probably some Labor Premier's fault. It, we are so far into this, and, and I think a lot of Australians who are getting frustrated and angry and wanting to go out and protest, whether it's about wanting freedom of movement or, or whatever else it is, is because they feel like there's no clear strategy or plan here in place. How do we get to a COVID normal? I think we all accept. We're not going back to normal normal. But, you know, I'm glad Omar named it tonight that some states are working on an elimination strategy. Hmm. When we started this, we were all kind of in this together and we were all going for suppression and flatten the curve. And then somewhere along the line, the process of national cabinet broke down. There was never a national strategy. It's become this this meandering mess. You know, you remember the Prime Minister was asked, let me say this, the Prime Minister was asked, are we going for elimination or suppression? He said, oh, we're somewhere, we're going to be somewhere between New Zealand and Sweden. Well, what does that mean? No wonder premiers seem to have taken a decision, they want elimination, and their public is really supporting them. Uh, when our veterans couldn't attend Anzac Day ceremonies and they did the right thing by having a candle or a light at the end of their driveways, I think they showed the example of what to do when you want to make a public point. And I don't no think any of the protests that, that fo have followed since then, when people wanted to make a public point, good on them, that's, that's why 102,000 names are on the War Memorial, so that people died, so that people could make a public point, so that no we could live in, in freedom and democracy. Just no on the 15th of March, when the Prime Minister initially suggested that we should protect the vulnerable and the elderly, and that we should focus on hot spots to flatten the curve. Mm. Why has that changed all of a sudden without telling anyone? Like, we're, 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 how come we've not been told that eradication... Of course, it's become obvious to us by what's happening in Victoria, like... We can't eradicate until <laughs> we get the vaccine. We, we just need to, yeah. we need to move on at this point. Yeah. And I just need to stress that DHSS in Victoria does say that there is no link between uh, those at the uh, protest, the Black Lives Matter protest, with COVID and the current uh, outbreak. OK, well, I'll, I'll accept that, but... People shouldn't be protesting. Okay. People should not be protesting. Our next question tonight comes from Yari Hyde. Yari Hyde. I'm a recent law graduate from the University of New South Wales. I came to Australia as an international student and am now on a temporary work visa. My question is for Christina Keneally. You recently argued in an article that Australia's post-pandemic response to temporary migration should be to limit it as far as possible. One of your reasons was that the presence of guest workers drives down wages for Australian workers. As an elected representative of the Labor Party, shouldn't your priority be to target the businesses that underpay their international workers, rather than wishing that those workers themselves should disappear into thin air? Chris, so that's not what I said. I don't want them to disappear. I want them to be able to stay. Do you know what, under this government, They've capped permanent migration at 160,000 people, but they have let temporary migration soar to historically high levels. And temporary migrants like you don't have access to the same rights. You can't assert your rights in the way that Australian citizens can at work. Senator, I'm just have... going to pull you up. Yep. I think it's worth reminding our audience what you did actually say. Yeah. Uh, you said that the post-COVID-19 yes. question we must ask now is this. 
When we restart our migration program, do we want migrants to return to Australia in the same, in the same size numbers and in the same composition as before? Exactly the, and you the said our answer should, should be, be no. no. And that's where I'm going before you pulled me up. Because here's the thing. When we have a country that is propped up by temporary migration, we have a group of people amongst us who are second class. You can't assert your same rights. You don't get the same access to services like job keeper and job seeker. You're cut out of all of that. And in fact, this government's narrowed the pathways to permanency. So in certain occupations or certain graduate programs, you'll never get the chance to stay here. Australia is a country made great by permanent migration. I, I, I came as you, a permanent migrant. Are you sort of migrant. twisting what your original no, argument no, was? No, no, my argument has been... It was widely viewed as a dog whistle on migration. Hamish, my argument has been... And now sort of spinning been, it as Hamish, this was something that was pro-migrants. Hey, Hamish, this has been my arguments I've had the portfolio. Go back and read a speech I gave at the Curtin Institute. It was reported in the media at the time. The big hoax that this government is pulling is that they're cap capping migration, permanent migration, but they're letting temporary migration soar to historically high levels. And that's a view of people as a disposable commodity. That's a view that we let temporary migrants come here, we use them for their labor, and then we ship them off when times get rough like COVID, or we never let them stay. I don't want us to be a guest worker so, nation. So coming out of I COVID, do we country, need to increase our migration intake? What we need to do is move towards greater pathways to permanency. No, but my question is, well, do we Hamish, need to increase our intake? Hamish, that's an impossible question to answer right now. Why? Because we don't know when the borders are going to open. We don't know what the unemployment rate's going to be. We don't know where the skill shortages are. But, but this, is, but this, but this goes to whether yeah. you believe in population growth as part of the pathway oh, out of this. Population growth is definitely part of the pathway out of this. My argument is if we are going to bring migrants back in, and of course I think we should because they play an important part to building the economy, there should be pathways to permanency. There should be more. What, what's your what's your um, visa class? You said you're a. Um, uh, it's called post study work visa. And, it's for graduates. And do you have the opportunity to stay here permanently? No, I don't. See, and my how, how point did you is, interpret? This how did you interpret the senator's article? Um, I thought the article said that we need less immigrants, not more. No, what we need That's is more people it, like too. you to be able to stay. What what's going to happen to you under this government? Is that you've come here? You've, you've gained skills, you've made connections, you might have even found someone you want to settle down and live with, I don't know. But this government's going to tell you you have to leave. My argument is we're a country built by permanent migration. Think of the okay. snowy hydro scene. Kim Rubenstein, this is I know you want to get in. Like well, I just you. think there's an interesting um, return to a point, which is um, Christina's point, which is a fair one about permanent residency being a more secure pathway to citizenship. Yep. But what value citizenship if your citizenship does not equate with any rights or, mm. or connections? So I think we, there is a profound question which COVID is amplifying well, about case, having to Kim, think through those issues. To be fair, a citizen or a permanent resident is getting job seeker and job keeper. Temporary migrant holders are not. Mm. What COVID has exposed is the vulnerable situation that temporary okay. migrants are in and the, the way that we have failed to support them. And we have extended certain measures to ensure that uh, those people, uh, migrants on, uh, on certain visas, were able to stay here and work because obviously there's a lot of work with the bushfires, a lot of work in regional Australia. The Regional Australia Institute uh, has identified 40,000 jobs available in regional Australia now, and not necessarily just in agriculture or indeed res the resource sector. Uh, there are so many jobs in regional Australia, and we're encouraging migrants to, to fill those jobs. Uh, the next question comes from regional Australia. It's Rebecca Barry in Absolute Victoria. We're farmers having farms in both South Australia and Western Victoria. When the hard border restrictions came in, our cross-border permit was cancelled. We were made to choose which farm we could be based at, completely splitting our family in two and being told to get someone else to check our livestock for us. It's had a huge impact to us personally and to our business. Who is accountable for what this is doing to farmers and where is our support and representation at a state level at a time that we need it? Tanya Dion. Well, yeah, I mean, we're needlessly destroying our regions and we're mm. seeing an enormous amount of double standards playing out in Australia. What do you uh, mean by double standards? Well, you know, we're seeing um, situations like the Queensland situation where um, the AFL has gone in with all their families into a luxury hotel where we see them lounging around the pool and then we see two Richmond football players um, arrested at all getting into trouble outside a, a strip club in 
the Gold Coast within their quarantine period, and yet we see families like that who, are, who pose no threat whatsoever to anyone. There's no COVID cases in their regions. But, but this is ultimately a question, Kim Rubin, <laughs> about accountability. <laughs> who, who can these people actually go to? Because we see the National Cabinet falling apart in terms of consistency. We're hearing the arguments tonight about the state's responsibility. You say the Constitution isn't clear. Yes. Where um, is the accountability well, on Well, on this point, in terms of the closing of borders and freedom of interstate trade and freedom of movement, there are constitutional sections, section 92 and section 117 of the Constitution, that do give guidance in decision-making in relation to this. And Clive Palmer's challenge to the Western Australian borders will be one framework for us to better understand where the proper so balance... So Clive's doing us all a favour. So, well, there will be a High Court uh, decision <laughs> at some point which will give some guidance. So, in that sense, his active citizenry there will have some guidance to the rest of the community. But, yeah. I mean, who can these individuals that find themselves in a situation like Rebecca is in, Yes. who do they go to? Well, they have um, in a federal system both their state and their federal representatives. So I guess in that very basic democratic sense, they go to their representatives to seek to challenge and to, um, you know, demonstrate their needs. But your underlying question is, right, how do we enable those voices to be better heard in our political system. And that's, why, that's why we're putting in place the Agricultural Code, like the uh, Transport Code, which uh, I have to say I worked very well with the Transport Ministers right across the country of all political persuasions. We worked very well in July. We put that uh, National Code through so that we could have access of movement uh, for mm. truck drivers, whatever the case might have been but as far as state border. Why is it that all of these months into this crisis, it's not clear, the rules aren't clear, there are still issues like this being ironed out. The National Cabinet has served us very well for, for a range of reasons. And, and I've got every but, hope but, that it will continue to do so. But, but we have had uh, different restrictions in different states putting in place those measures at different times, Hamish. And so that has exacerbated the issue. Tanya, I can see you trying to get back. Yeah, there. sorry. I was, I was just going to say, I think the reason is the National Cabinet worked for a while, but it's not working now because our focus has continued to be on just COVID cases and COVID deaths. And there are so many other indicators that we need to be talking about. We need to be balancing the risks against freedoms and rights. We need to be balancing costs and benefits. We need to be balancing COVID cases and deaths against other deaths from other illnesses that are not being screened pro yeah. properly. We need to balance it against mental health and other mental illnesses. We need to balance it against the economic costs, to your point, and the costs of all of our businesses being decimated, the lives and livelihoods and the mental health that is going to destroy us. Uh, our next question think, tonight is I a think, video... Uh, I was just going to say, that's the, that's the first time I've, I've agreed with something Tanya said tonight. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, uh, exactly what needs to happen. We do need to find a balance. And with the borders, uh, they are effective, they're important, but there is... Uh, same with the international border. There's a need for compassion and for a bit of flexibility to understand people's situations, especially in those populated border areas. We can do better. It's it's not that difficult and we can do better. When you say that flexibility, Omar, are you talking about the Premiers here or are you talking about the Federal Government? I'm talking about the Premiers working together, recognising that they've got big border communities and there's all sorts of impacts, not just businesses but health, even health workers moving uh, between borders. It, it's true. very disrupted and their, their movement, those people moving across the border, is not going to pose a COVID risk to the people on the other side of the border. Okay. Uh, it's complex but uh, we just need to work it out. All right, we do need to move on to our next question. It's a video from Maria Hitchcock in Armidale West, New South Wales. At the start of the pandemic, the Australian government's border force took responsibility for quarantine by evacuating people from Wuhan to Christmas Island uh, and then later to Darwin. They also evacuated people from the Diamond Princess to Darwin. Yet a month later, Australian government's border force didn't want to take any responsibility for quarantine at all. When the Ruby Princess stopped in Sydney, border force didn't want to take any responsibility. Why was there a shift in Border Force's responsibility between the start of the pandemic and a month later? Kim Rubenstein, I'm going to go to you first because you've proven so useful <laughs> at, at distilling all of this yeah, for us tonight. Thanks. It seems that still there's confusion about 
who does have responsibility? Look, I think this is the other underlying structural issue with our constitution that has been an ongoing one but has been so amplified by COVID. There are so many different policy areas in Australia where we haven't been able to make great progress because of the federal-state relationship but not being clear enough but also because it is a legacy of a, of a constitution that was drafted in the 1890s by white bearded men who were thinking in structural terms about the states being responsible for the private sphere and the federal government being responsible for the public outward sphere. But our worlds have changed since the 1890s. And women's policy is a particular area that really highlights this. You look at domestic violence, you look at early childhood education and care, they are foundational social issues that impact on all of Australia. But we haven't been able to develop a unified policy because of the fragmented nature of the, of the nation. And none of these things are particularly local or at the time of Federation, there were quite distinct differences between the states. And in some ways, in terms of COVID, we're seeing some differences where the states need to take into account. Sure. But the bottom line, Hamish, is that we really do need to come together as citizens and mm. say our structural underpinnings and COVID has amplified are not good enough. And we need a better way of coordinating public policy in Australia mm. to improve the lives of everybody. So, Deputy Prime Minister, to the specifics of that question, why was there a shift in Border Force's responsibility between the start of the pandemic and then a month later? Which well, the, I must commend at the start Qantas for actually doing that uh, mercy flight out of Wuhan and making sure that uh, those Australians were rescued. And uh, certainly to Alan Joyce and, and, and perhaps the more importantly, the air crew who volunteered... But you know this is a question about the Ruby Princess. Yeah, oh, no, I appreciate that. And the Commission of Inquiry said that uh, uh, there were failings. Um, there, there were, and we, we understand, we recognise that. New South Wales Health, unfortunately, there were, there were things there that which uh, just didn't add up. And uh, I know they brought down their, their findings just the other day. And, uh, and the Australian Border Force uh, were not in fact, um, held responsible for what happened with the Ruby Princess. And there were 22 deaths from that uh, Ruby Princess outbreak. And, you know, again, we, we mourn for those families who've lost loved ones out of it. The inquiry in New South Wales was, was pretty clear, Christina Keneally. This was uh, due to failings, uh, serious mistakes made, uh, in the words of Brett Walker, by New South Wales Health. And the Border Force had no relevant yeah. responsibility. Well, the Prime Minister said on um, 15 March that Australian Border Force would be in direct command of arriving cruise ships. His words, not mine. Uh, four days later, the Ruby Princess arrived. 2,700 passengers got off. They didn't even do the traveller with illness checklist. And that's not Border Force's responsibility under the Commonwealth law. That's actually the Federal Department of Agriculture. So, yes, New South Wales made mistakes. Absolutely. Don't resile from that. But the Prime One Minister the... said, hold on, just a minute, home. the Prime Minister said a border force would be in charge. They weren't. No changes were made to those arrangements to put border force in charge. The only two agencies on board the Ruby Princess on the morning of 19 March, New South Wales Health wasn't there. It was Federal Department of Agriculture and Australian Border Force. To this day, neither of those agencies can tell the Senate Oversight Committee on COVID who gave permission for passengers to leave the ship. Nobody can say who did it or at what time. It's literally they looked out and saw people leaving the ship and said, oh, gosh, I guess we've now granted critique or approval. So he had a situation... To, to be fair, you don't know what they said at all. I mean, no, they, I was the... speculating. No, no, this is, this is evidence before the committee that they literally looked out and saw people leaving the ship and decided critique had been granted. Uh, Omar... I mean, come on, they didn't even do the Traveller with Illness checklist on board the ship, which was meant to catch the very circumstance the Ruby Princess had, which was the ship's doctor was so busy in the day before the ship arrived, she didn't have time with, with illness, she didn't have time to upload it to the health log that New South Wales Health would have seen. That's what agriculture is there to do, to find out what's happened in the last 24 hours. They didn't do it. Oh, Mark Horshid, you were trying to get in. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of finger pointing going on here, and uh, while we're doing it, I'm going to join in. The, uh, th there's one there's one agency that was missing uh, from that cruise ship, and that is a Centre for Disease Control or CDC, and that's something that the AMA has been calling for for a long time. Uh, and we would have been so much better prepared in Australia for this pandemic in all sorts of ways: our health sector, our borders. But there, there would have been an agency that was actually tasked with 
looking after human health coming off a cruise ship rather than relying on the Department of Agriculture, which seems quite bizarre. Uh, I know there's constitutional issues with the CDC because it does cross those state federal lines, mm -hmm. but this is uh, it's, it's a strong lesson from COVID that we need to do better for the next pandemic. I think that's a good point to end on, and we, we all know we need to get Kim Rubenstein back for a solo Q&A to figure <laughs> out what's wrong with the Federation. Thanks to all of our panel tonight, Tanya de Jong, Michael McCormack, Dr Omar Korshid, Christina Keneally and Kim Rubenstein. Would you please give them all a round of applause? Uh, thanks to those of you here in the studio. It's so great to have uh, what we're allowed back at a safe distance in the studio and to those of you at home for sharing your stories and questions too. And thanks to those of you watching on iView tonight.